Well, all right, let me jump on over to the Right Side Way opening monologue, as I do every day. I, I start off with some comments, and today, i got to be honest with you, today I'm going to give you a bit of, um, well, it's history plus a lesson all at the same time. So here's the thing. We're, we're coming up on the 41st anniversary this month, the 41st anniversary of an event that many people have already forgotten about. It was a military action right here in our hemisphere that saw untold heroism and true combat action against communist forces. And yet, like I said, most folks have forgotten about it. We all know the stories about Mogadishu in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Beirut Marine Barracks bombing. But how many people in the U.S. remember that we actually fought, the U.S. did, a pitched battle to rescue a thousand Americans and stop the influx of communist troops coming in from Cuba and taking hold of a tiny island nation because it was the right thing to do? It was Operation Urgent Fury the invasion of the island of Grenada. So let me start by saying I spent a number of my years in the military on jump status as a paratrooper. I was a qualified jump master. That meant that I was often responsible for some aspect of the airborne operations that my unit conducted. So whether on the ground as the departure area control officer in the aircraft to conduct final inspections and outside air safety checks and putting the paratroopers out the door on target to hit the drop zone, well, it was, it was high adventure and memories that I will not soon forget. And I got to tell you, Despite how it looks, the amount of time you spent preparing for each drop is, generally speaking, a by-the-book, safety-oriented, step-by-step sequence of events. I mean, in a training jump, every single jumper had to go through a pre-jump training, a jump master brief, a departure area brief, a practice actions in the aircraft, but perhaps most importantly were the rehearsals on how to land. I mean, what to do in the event of a parachute malfunction. We used to always say with some dark humor that, Anybody can fall out of a perfectly good airplane. It's how you land that makes a difference. And that is very true. So these were all static line jumps. No free falls, just static line. That meant that you had a cloth static line that was hooked to the back of your main parachute harness. The jumper wore it on your back. But the other end of the static line was actually clipped and secured to a steel cable inside the aircraft. And when the jumper exited the aircraft, whether it be a fixed wing or a rotary wing, a helicopter, the static line would stretch out to its full length, and when it hit the end, it would basically jerk the jumper's main parachute out of its pack tray. I mean, sometimes the chute shock from those jumps, especially when Air Force pilots didn't bother to slow down all the way to proper jump speed, it could give you some serious whiplash if you didn't keep your chin tucked down tight to your chest. But every jumper has two parachutes. Every jumper has a main and a reserve. The main is on your back, and the reserve chute is right in front of you, strapped to the jumper's front waist area. And once you leave the bird, every jumper is supposed to count for the requisite number of seconds, like four to six seconds, depending on what kind of aircraft. And you literally count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. You're thinking, where's the chute? And boom, boom, then it comes out. If you don't feel that massive chute shock, you don't look around to see where it is, you've got an immediate decision to make. You pull the reserve. I say all that because when we jumped in training, well, the usual minimum safe altitude was 800 feet above ground level. So we would typically jump from between 800 and 1,200 feet, depending on conditions. If you were loaded down with combat equipment and the air was cold and you had a big breakfast, you could expect to be in the air for maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds, sometimes a minute. Felt like forever. But if your main parachute didn't deploy and you were in a terminal fall, you had mere seconds to get your reserve chute deployed. We trained over and over and over again on what to do. When to pull the reserve handle, how to pull the reserve handle, how to land under reserve chutes, over and over and over. It was ingrained to the point that it was supposed to be like muscle memory. I cannot remember ever jumping a static line without that fat reserve chute strapped to my midsection. It was an extra measure of confidence. It could mean life or death. And now I'll get back to my story about Grenada. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was a young lieutenant, we had a sergeant in my unit who was just kind of revered by the men. He had been a ranger instructor. Before that, he had served with the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. His, his dress uniform looked like a South American dictator to us. I mean, at a time when most troops had never been to war, he had a ranger tab, combat instruments badge, a bronze star for valor, a purple heart, and very notably, he had a very rare set of combat jumpmaster wings. That meant that he had actually parachuted into a combat zone. So in 1983, October to be exact, President Reagan initiated Operation Urgent Fury when Marxist rebels took a number of U.S. citizens hostage on the island nation of Grenada. So this sergeant that I'm talking about, he jumped into Grenada with the First Rangers. But on that mission, everything I just told you about, 
All those protocols for safe static line jumping, they went out the window. All the protocols changed when contact was made with the enemy. This was not only a fight that needed to happen, but it was a fight that was going to happen, and it was going to be men doing things that were extreme. And the Rangers were scheduled to conduct, initially, just an air land seizure. They were going to land the planes, offload, and seize the airfield in order to prepare for the next wave of U.S. forces. But en route to the landing site, it was learned that the enemy had already placed obstructions all over the runway, making it impossible to land. And to make things worse, heavy anti-aircraft and weather conditions were making it very difficult. The first pass of Rangers that hit the ground came into immediate contact with the enemy. Within 20 minutes, the jump masters on board the planes yelled that the Rangers were in contact on the ground, that all personnel were now switching to a parachute assault. They immediately began an in-flight rig. That's where you load up with your parachutes while you're in the plane. No time for jump master inspections. And then came the announcement that in order to avoid enemy fire, they were going to exit the aircraft at top speed at only 500 feet above ground. 500 feet. With so little time under canopy, the decision was made at some point that in order to save time on rigging, the Rangers were going to jump without reserve chutes. I mean, y'all... This is everything that goes against the grain of what we had learned, right? They're jumping below the usual minimum safe altitude, under enemy fire, with no reserves. It was an all-in moment. Static line is hard, y'all. Static line in combat is harder. Static line in combat at 450 to 500 feet with no reserve is unheard of. I know rangers who told me they broke every rule. One guy watched his buddy break a belt of M60 ammo out and load his machine gun in the plane and jump out the door with his M60 hanging around his neck. Why am I telling you all this? What is my point? Well, part of it's history. Operation Urgent Fury, the invasion of Grenada, is a mission that's almost lost to time now. We rescued a thousand Americans. We went there because we had to, because we had Americans in harm's way. Think about what you see nowadays where we abandon Americans in Afghanistan. But the other part, though, is the level of commitment that these men exhibited. When they heard they had brothers in arms in contact on the ground in need of immediate relief, that changed the entire dynamic. It meant that they were suddenly willing and able to exit a perfectly good airplane with tracer rounds in the air at below a generally accepted safe jump altitude into a hot drop zone with no reserve. Having no reserve meant no extra personal safety. No reserve meant no way out. No reserve was a total commitment to whatever was going to come. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need more of that today. We need a mindset in this country that says all in, no reserve, whatever it takes. Because the progressive left right now will tell us over and over again that America is an imperialist nation, that we are systemically racist, that we need to consider climate equity and disaster relief equity and hiring equity, but never firing equity. Of course not. Look, I'm tired of the constant haranguing of the progressive left that celebrates, accentuates, and even mandates the decline of a no-reserve mentality. Make no mistake that foreign policy that focuses on appeasement and avoidance only invites bad actors to act badly. Whether it be on the world stage in the presence of a near-peer adversary or the local school board meeting or in a Walmart parking lot, we need more Americans to remember what it means to have a no-reserve mentality. I celebrate when I come across stories of men and women who are willing to go hard places and do hard things. I think that despite the overreaching attempts of the left to denigrate the American spirit and to water down standards, that the vast majority of Americans feel as I do that what made us a great nation was the blessings of an almighty God and a controlled recklessness in the way we did our business. America has always traditionally been a no-reserve nation a place where the cowboy spirit conquered the West, where the industrial base changed the modern world, where the men and women went to war to save the world from tyranny, where respect and honor were more important than gold and power. We put men on the moon, all in, no reserve, and we need more of it. And the left hates it. They need us to be passive and quiet and willing to acquiesce so they can pass their debilitating agendas to water down values and destroy traditions, demean faith and Rework America into a place where every citizen is dependent on government and has no personal ambition. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, God bless those who are willing to go all in when they're needed. God bless those who can hear that troops are in contact or friends are in need or communities need their voices or churches need volunteers. And they can pivot away from whatever plan they've got and be willing to jump in feet first with a no reserve attitude. 41 years ago this month, Operation Urgent Fury. No reserve. 
And that's a wrap for the Right Side Way. <laughs>